Okay, um, welcome. Welcome, Sylvia and um, Robinson, I guess, and Chanel and Jacob. And let's see who else we got. Uh, Wen Tao. Um, so welcome, and hopefully we'll get a few more coming in. So the plan today and for this webinar, this is a webinar on chapters one and two. I want to let you know I'm not going to be doing every detail of chapter one and two. That's not what these webinars are about. Um, if I did that, I'd either have to talk really, really fast or I'd have to do it for hours. And I don't do that. This is to kind of show you some of the highlights of chapter one and two, kind of show you where it's used in today's world instead of, you know, kind of canned things that I might have taped a year ago. But I like to bring in current stuff, stuff that's happening right away, and things about you too, if possible. So, uh, I also, are there any questions at all about anything? This is a great time. I always like to start with questions if you have any. Are there any questions? Give you a minute. Okay, I'm not hearing any questions. Okay, so just to let you know, chapters one and two are kind of introductory chapters. A lot of it you have probably already seen in high school, okay, or in your past life, wherever that is, when you did math. So that's one reason why I do two chapters in uh, one week, and it's the first week where we have a lot of stuff going on trying to figure it out where the class is going. But it, it's not that hard. If you read through the chapters in the book, um, I don't, people don't get stuck on this stuff. I do want to warn you, next week we only have one chapter. That's chapter three. And most people consider that, a lot of people consider that the hardest chapter of the whole book. So this week we got two chapters. Next week we got one chapter that's much harder than both chapters combined. So just a little warning about you know, what's coming next. Um, this week is a lot of vocabulary. So I'm going to go through some of it, not all of it. Again, you're responsible for reading the textbook uh, chapters and also watching the, the two major chapter videos. Um, but I want to go through that. OK, so I'm just going to share. And that would be And I'm also getting feedback. So remember, if, uh, especially if you have background stuff, um, Hit the mute button until you're ready to talk, and then uh, that way we don't have to all hear the background stuff. So I'm going to go share my screen, but not this particular site, but this site. Okay, so uh, I don't know if y'all recognize this. Do we have people from Tahoe here? But this is one of our big newspapers. And so if you're not from Tahoe, that's okay. You can believe that this is one of our big news station, news media things. And I want to scroll down, so I always like to bring in, and they do a poll. So the question in the poll is, um, should dogs be allowed in public parks within the city of South Lake Tahoe? Okay, so that's a big question, a lot of debate about that. And I want, let's vote. Okay, so you have three choices. You have yes, no, and you have don't care, I'm a cat person. So if you can um, pop it into, your chat box and type in your vote, then we'll vote as a group. So I'm looking, I don't see anyone. You gotta type in yes, no, or uh, cat person. Cat is good enough. All right, we got a yes and then we'll vote. And I wanna kinda share the reason why I'm doing this. Okay, so the first thing, okay, so we got three yeses and a no. And I know if you're on the phone, you may not be able to do it unless you're on the phone with a smartphone and using Skype, and then you should be able to do it. So that's the hope. Um, it's a lot better to be on something where you can actually see. So if you have a smartphone, and um, you, you should really be uh, smartphone Skyping in and not just calling in with voice, because it's gonna be very hard for you to follow if it's just, um, if it's just sound. Okay, not impossible, but harder. Okay, so. We're looking at yes, um, except for when Tao, you're saying no, everyone else says yes. So I'm gonna vote. Okay, notice that the question here, the answers are words and they're not numbers. So when we have the answer to the survey question or the answer to the experiment or the, what you're gonna write down for the data, 
And when that data is a bunch of words like yeses and nos and don't cares, then we call it qualitative. So that's an important word that we have in this class. Okay, there are really going to be a few types of different uh, variables that we can have. One is qualitative. The other is if instead I asked you, which I'm going to ask you a little later, a survey question such as um, how much do you weigh? Then that's quantitative because there's a number answer. Okay, if I asked you, say, how many siblings are in your family? Then that is also quantitative. But how much you weigh and how many siblings are actually quite different. Because how many siblings, I can actually list out all the possible answers. Okay. So, for example, anyone want to type in how many siblings in your family? Can you type that in in your chat box? Two, 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 and one, and four. Okay. So notice those, I could list all the possible answers. I bet you no one could guess how many siblings are in my family. Any thoughts? A trick question. Can't be zero because uh, there's always yourself. <laughs> You're in your own family. Okay. It's actually 4.5. So modern family. I have a stepsister. <laughs> and stepsisters or half sisters or that that's a half. <laughs> so it's 4.5, but you really can't have anything other than halves. You can't you have either whole numbers or halves. You don't have, you can't have 4.135 siblings, right? That doesn't make any sense. So if you have a list of answers, and the answers are numbers, but you can list all the possibilities, and send it as dot, 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 then that we call discrete. On the other hand, if I ask, for example, um, what, how much do you weigh exactly, you can't list all the possible weights because that includes decimal points. So that we call continuous. Those are the three main types of survey questions. So we have the qualitative, we have the quantitative discrete, and we have the quantitative continuous. Any questions on that idea so far? Okay, so now let's vote. And it should happen. Uh oh. Tried to vote. Let's try again. One more try. I'm going to vote yes, because that's what most of you guys said. And click vote. Ah, you've already voted. Well, I voted, but it didn't tell me anything. All right, so let's try one more time. Sorry about that. I'm going to view results. Good enough. OK, so here's our results. OK, 64% um, said dogs should be allowed in public parks. 36% said they shouldn't. And nobody said they don't care they're a cat person. Okay, of all the people that voted, which is interesting because I actually did this with my face-to-face -face class yesterday and there were 1,200 different votes. But I don't know what this site just did. <laughs> Stuff happens. So the question I have for you, is this a good representation of people in Tahoe? If you really want to get a feel for how people in Tahoe um, think about whether dogs should be allowed in public parks, because maybe you know, the city council wants to decide on policy and they want to find out what the city thinks. Is this a good way of doing it? What do y'all think? So you have to answer, by the way. You could put in your chat box or you can talk. I don't think it's a good way because you can get people like, I'm not from Tahoe. So you get people who are outside of Tahoe voting. Okay, that's definitely one thing. You can get people outside of Tahoe. I'm actually in Tahoe right now, but you're right about that. Uh, anyone think differently or have different reasons? Okay, what if they made sure that you're in Tahoe? Made, they made sure that when you clicked on the computer thing, you had to have a Tahoe address. Then would this be okay? What do y'all think? I, I think since it's so South Lake Tahoe, it would be more accurate. Mm -hmm. Okay. It turns out this is a very flawed study. And it's a flawed study for a different reason. Um, this study has a big bias. Have you heard the word bias before? 
Okay, so you've heard it. I don't know if you know the technical meaning in statistics, but what it means is that when you have a biased study, the sample statistic, in this case, we're looking at the 64% that said yes, is likely to either be higher or lower than the population. And that's called a bias. So for example, what I have found is that people who are really passionate about dogs tend to be the ones that vote. And the people who really are not passionate, they're not gonna put in the effort to click. What do you guys think? Do you agree that that might be true? Okay, so there's yeah. a good chance that, I know we only had 11, but let, let's say we're thinking about yesterday's where I had 1,200 votes. There's a good chance that the people who vote are gonna be more likely to say yes than the total South Tahoe population. And that's a problem because if we're trying to use a survey to get information about the population, this is a poorly done survey. Okay, let me give you an example of one that was much more famous that you probably all know about that happened about a year ago. Okay, what was the big survey done about 11 months ago that turned out to be wrong? Think about, I know it's hard to think 11 months ago, but what was everybody talking about 11 months ago? Oh, and I'll be quiet. <laughs> Not just in Tahoe, all of America. That's a hint. The election? The election. And if you know what happened, if you took, if you, if you looked at, if you remember the news in the election, if you remember September or October, what were they all saying after doing a survey? They were saying Hillary was going to win? Yep. Everyone said Hillary was going to win. Every yep. single study. Do you guys remember that? Yep. What happened? Hopefully you know your reason. <laughs> okay, Hillary did not win. One thing, by the way, I will bring in politics, but I'm never going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to go there. But I will analyze what went wrong at a political poll because that's my job. So what went wrong? What went wrong is the same thing that could go wrong here, is that there was what's called voluntary response bias. And that is when they ask a survey, there's always gonna be a group of people who hang up the phone or don't click and don't answer the survey. And there's gonna be a group of people that do answer the survey. And voluntary response bias is very difficult to deal with, but it can cause disasters as we saw in the people who were trying to predict the election last year, okay? What happened is that people who were more likely to vote for Hillary were the same kind of people that were more likely to answer their phone and do a survey. And people that were more likely to vote for Trump were more likely to hang up when asked to answer a survey. Okay, and I've done a lot of analysis and that seems to be the reason why things went wrong. It was that the who answered and the who answered were the people that were more likely to vote for Clinton. Does that make sense? What's that? Somebody tried to talk, but I didn't quite hear. Okay, um, so now the, the harder question how do you fix it? How do you get a good sample? Let's do something a little easier than all of America. All of America is really hard. Let's just think about our town. And I go, you don't live here, but we're, we're a town. We're, we have about 23,000 people. And let's suppose you want to survey 500 of them. Okay, which is a pretty small survey, but it, it's not too bad. Who do you survey? Because I told you that this way of doing it, putting it online and asking you know, those who want to vote to vote, um, that's got all kinds of problems. How do you have a scientific study, okay, that works in this class? That's what we care about. We want a study that's going to provide information that's best information about the whole population. Any thoughts on how you might do that? Not seeing you all jump in at once. Okay. Again, I don't expect you to necessarily know, but maybe you have some ideas. Okay. There are a few possibilities. 
One, which is impossible, but the best if you could do it, if you could get the name of every person in Tahoe and their address, and what you could do is you could use a computer to randomly select 500 names. Computers are very good at randomly selecting names. I'm not gonna get involved in the mathematics of picking random names, but there's some hard mathematics about randomization. So you don't have to know how to do it, but you have to know that computers can do that. Do you all believe that? You can list them by number, all 23,000 people, and then ask the computer, randomly give me 500 numbers between one and 23,000, and it will do that. Okay, then you gotta deal with the volunteer response. Any suggestion on making sure that all 500 people answer? Positive incentive? Yeah, positive incentive. So let me give you an example that happened to me personally. Happened a few years back. I got a call and they said, we'll give you $100 if you answer this survey. I bet you guys would all say yes, wouldn't you? That was a good day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a really good day. Uh, everybody say, says yes to that one. Okay, it gets expensive, but you can do it. Okay, so that's one way of dealing with the voluntary response bias is you do a positive incentive, okay? So you could do some kind of positive incentive, but it gets very expensive sometimes. And then you go and you survey them all, all 500 people that you've picked on the computer. Okay, all kinds of problems with that in terms of, I mean, it's a great study if you could do it, but the problem is first, you can't get everyone's names. That's not public information. You can't get their address. You um, probably don't have enough money to give them $100 each, right? because uh, 500 people at $100 each, $50,000. Do you see how things get really expensive really fast? Okay, so that doesn't work, okay? Occasionally you'll see a survey like that, but it doesn't usually work. So instead, another way of doing it is you identify where some of the biases might be. So for example, one bias might be age, okay? Old people versus younger people versus middle people, you know, et cetera. They might be more or less likely to um, want to allow dogs in public parks. So if you've identified that that is one of the concerns you have of making sure that you don't overrepresent or underrepresent by age, for example, then what you do is you can go um, pretty easily, go online, find out the ages of the town. And by, I'm talking about South Lake Tahoe, but you can do the same thing for where you live too. It would work anywhere. And it's pretty easy to find out the distribution of ages. Um, lots of sites will show you that. And then what you do is you take the percent, so for example, percent of millennials. Let's say that was 30% of our population. Then you multiply 30% times 500. And that's 150. Okay, you can use a calculator by the way. And you make sure you survey 150 millennials. Okay, and then you do the same thing and you find out how many Gen X's there are. And let's suppose that you found out there were 25% Gen Xers. You take 25% of 500, which is 125, and you survey 125 Gen Xers. So what you've done by doing that is you've made sure that there's no age-related bias. Any questions on that? Okay. What besides age might be something you'd worry about being biased? Gender? Yeah, gender. Gender is definitely something that you don't want to be all one, um, male or all female. Okay, so what you do, very easy to find out. Don't assume it's 50-50, by the way. Um, for example, at our college, do you think, um, do you think we're 50-50? Do you think there's more men or more women? A tough little question. What do you guys think? There's more women. Okay. You all agree? I'd agree. Okay. The interesting thing is you probably don't know all the details of our college. There used to be more women. But then we opened up a new program and had a whole lot of students and it's called the incarcerated <laughs> student program. So we go to the big prisons and we teach them. And there's a whole lot more men than women who go to prison. 
And because of that, all of a sudden we have all these men and there's more men at the, the college than women. So again, but the only way you know that is to go online or, or to go to our library or go somewhere and find out, do research. It's not usually hard research, but it's research you have to do. So what you do is you find the percent of men and women, and then you make sure you get that amount. Okay. Other things that you might think there might be biases is how many people own a dog? What percentage of people who live here own a dog? That would probably be important, don't you think? So you can maybe look that one up. That might be harder to do the research on, but it might be there. And then you get that percent and you make sure that you don't have too many dog owners or too many um, non-dog owners, right? Cat people, as they said. Does that make total sense? Okay, and the more of those you do, the less bias you have. Okay, you still have the voluntary response bias, but maybe you can cut some of the issues if you make sure that you are representative of the population. And you do that using stratified sampling. So can you remember stratified? Okay, so there's another way of doing sampling. Okay, let's suppose we wanted to do it with college students because that's easier, easier to ask college students. In that case, you probably don't need to be stratified. There's another, there's another sampling technique that works and it particularly makes sure there's no voluntary response bias. And what that involves is you take your population and you see if there are natural clusters at which the population lies in. So for example, in, at the college, the natural clusters are the classes. This class right here, that's a cluster. Okay, another cluster might be the, um, we, we have a class on volleyball and that's a cluster. We have a class on um, EMT. We have a class uh, for prisoners in this class, actually. So prison statistics, okay? But we do really do have that class, I'm not making it up. Okay, so we have all these different classes. So what you do is you identify a group of classes that represent the population, and then you go to each of the classes and you have everyone in the class answer the question. And the good thing about doing it at a college is that if you have an instructor saying, fill out the survey, everyone does it. And you don't have voluntary response bias. So if you break the population into clusters, identify some of the clusters, and ask everybody in those clusters, we call it cluster sampling. Any questions on that? Okay, and that works pretty well. Okay, now these aren't perfect, but they work pretty well. Identifying good clusters is a, is a challenge. Okay, but the good thing about colleges is you almost get everyone to fill it out. If the professor says, fill out the survey, you're gonna fill out the survey, especially if you get extra points. Sounds right? Okay, another kind of survey, a design or sampling technique, is something called systematic sampling. And what that involves is another way of making sure you avoid bias. So for example, our college could look at every, every 50th person who enrolls at the college. And every 50th person gets the survey. And no one else, just those 50. Does that make sense? Okay, just those every 50th. Until there's your 500 people if we have that many students. Okay, that's called systematic sampling. It works well in that situation. It also works really well in manufacturing. So if you're in business and you're, you're making something, let's say you're making, um, I don't know, automobiles, then you might, and you wanna find out if the airbags work, okay? Well, it's very expensive to find out if an airbag works because what's the foolproof way of finding out if it works? Crash test. Yeah, you crash the car. Okay, well, you certainly can't do that with every car you've got because you won't have any cars left, right? So you can't have a giant sample. You wanna decide, all right, which cars on, in that manufacturing process should you test? And typically you do a systematic sample on that. So maybe one, every 1,000th car gets the crash test. And then you check it, see if the airbag worked or didn't work. And if it worked, it's a yes. If it didn't work, it's a no. Okay, which is qualitative by the way. And and then you know you have an unbiased study. Any questions on that? 
So those are different ways. Okay. The first one that I talked about where you get a computer to, to grab the people and, you know, totally randomize it. That's called systematic random. Uh, that's called, uh, sorry, that's called uh, simple random sampling. It's called simple random sampling. So I'm going through a lot of words. All this is in the book. It's also in the other video. So all this is there. I want to kind of do the main highlight. And that really is this whole sampling technique. It's a challenge. Okay, and they get and people get it wrong all the time. Other issues you have to worry about are sample size, right? Do you think this poll was big enough sample size? Eleven people. What do you think? No. Yeah, no. It, that's, that's terrible. By the way, <laughs> if you ever if you ever see a study of eleven people, you should say, "Boy, that was stupid." Um, that tells you nothing about the population or very little. So now the harder question is, how many people do you need? And that's a hard question, isn't it? How many people do you need so you have good information that's going to help you understand the population? We're not doing that today in terms of the calculation, but later on we're going to have, we're going to have some calculations. Generally, you need over a thousand for the yes/no question, and you typically need over thirty for the quantitative question. Okay, and that's just generally. If you want really good data for the quantitative, you need over a hundred, but thirty at least gets you something. Okay, those are kind of standard numbers, and over thirty, so thirty-one. Okay, and we'll talk about that another day in terms of the reasoning for that. There'll be some math formulas. Remember, this is a math class. Today won't feel like very much like it's a math class, by the way, but it is. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so now what I want to do, um, now that we've talked a little bit about kind of a highlight of some of the chapter one, I want to talk about statistics. So first thing, um, what is a statistic? Anyone know? What's the name of this class? You can type in the chat box or say it. You've heard the word, right? I'll cheat because I have the definition right here. With the yeah, that's good. You're smart is what that is. Um, <laughs> it says a number that represents a property of the sample. Good, good. And I want to emphasize the last word you just said, which was, say it one more time. Sample. Sample. Okay, so, a, so you collect a sample. And then the numbers that the, the biggest, most important number is typically the, the mean, which is also the average. Okay, that's the biggie. You're usually most interested in the average. When you think about it, isn't that what everyone talks about? Okay, if it's a yes, no question, it's the proportion. That's all you've got. Um, but there's a whole lot more statistics than just those. There's things like uh, for a quantitative, there's a whole lot of statistics, the minimum. The maximum, you've heard those words, right? Um, there's a standard deviation, we'll talk about that today, actually. There's the first quartile and the third quartile, we'll talk about that, the interquartile range. Uh, I could go on and on and on about all the different statistics that you might be interested in, okay? But the important thing is a statistic is about the sample. If you have the entire population, which is rare, but if you have the entire population, it's not a statistic, it's a parameter. So we call it a population parameter. For example, the mean, uh, the mean weight of all people in the United States. That's a population parameter. It's not a statistic, because I said the word all. Okay, unfortunately, you can never get that weight. Even if you read it online, that's fake. Okay, why can't you get the mean weight of all people in America? But what, why can't you do it? There's way too many people to even contact. Because there's people that here that we don't even know exist. People can't find certain people. So that's why certain criminals get away with stuff. We can't find them. Yeah, yeah, you can't find it. I don't want to get into the criminal thing, but you definitely can't find, you know, there, there's over 300 million Americans. Good luck 
especially if I said you, like all by yourself. In fact, we have something called the census. It's in our constitution of the United States. And that's the one place you pretty much have a parameter. And they do very little in the census, right? All they ask is basically where you live and how old you are. They ask very few things. And they just want to make sure to figure out how many, um, how many Congress people should there be in each area. That's the reason for the census. And that costs hundreds of millions of dollars just to find those two questions out. Scary, isn't it? So you can't find the parameter. So the, what we do in, in this class is we find a statistic. And we know that that statistic is not exactly the same as a parameter. So we could survey, say, 5,000 Americans. We know that's not the average weight of all Americans. It's only the average weight of those 5,000. But if you did a good job and you did a stratified sample, for example, when you try to do everything you can to, to limit bias, then that weight that you're going to get, that mean weight from the 5,000, is likely to be pretty close to the mean weight for everybody. Any questions on that? That's what statistics is all about. That's what this class is all about. So then the question is, what does pretty close mean? So if you say the mean weight of all Americans is 140 pounds, based on a statistic, well, are you off by one pound? Are you off by 10 pounds? How much do you think you might be off by? And of course, you don't know exactly what you're off by, but you can talk about the probability you're off by a certain weight. And that's what we're doing in this class. So what you're doing is you are collecting a sample, you're using the statistics from the sample and the information you're gonna learn in this class and talking about how reliable those statistics are. Okay, we're not gonna do that today because that's the entire class. So today is just to introduce what we're doing. Any questions on that idea? Any questions? Okay, let's collect some statistics that are quantitative. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase these guys, except it's gotta let me do it. I'm freezing. Try this again. So it's very refreshing. So I don't know if you remember, but I told you I made a spreadsheet for this class that has everything you need. So this is the one variable statistics, but I'm getting the spinning wheel of death. Hopefully it'll eventually come in. Sorry about that. One thing you should be used to with technology is you always cross your fingers and hope it's gonna work. So I think it's still loading, it says. Um, the internet is not as fast as I'd like it to be. Still working, it's almost there, almost. Still there. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to tell me how far you are right now from Lake Todd Community College. I'm zero miles, by the way, from, and give me a miles. I'm zero miles from Lake Todd Community College. Hopefully you know what that means, right? <laughs> um, but how far are you? And you can put it in the chat box or you can say it and I'm going to type it. Two miles? Okay, keep going. I want everyone to give me the answer. Five miles? We got some Tahoe people. That might be Myers. So there's a group of you here. I'm probably the furthest, 469 miles. 469, what are you, San Diego? Um, no, I'm Glendale. Glendale, okay. Not too far from there. Okay, what else? 461. How much? One more time. Four, 400. You said 461 miles. 461. Okay. So either you're a neighbor of the person who's 469, or you are uh, maybe north of here in, uh, like, I don't know, um, Oregon or something. I'm 374. So 374. Okay. A couple more, or. Everyone have a chance. I'm 470. 470. Right. I didn't expect three right next to each other. We also have 160. You probably could look out your window and see each other. 
<laughs> okay. All right. So what I want to show you are some statistics. And notice, let's suppose that um, the population was this class. So I'm going to look at the statistics and talk about what they mean. But if I don't drink water, I can't talk. Okay. So let's just start. I'm just going to start and read down on the screen. So the minimum was two. Hopefully, you didn't need to take this class to know what that means. Okay. Um, so that was someone who, and I didn't write down the name, so I don't remember who was who. But somebody lives two miles from this campus. Okay. So that's in South Lake Tahoe. The mean was 277 point, uh, about 277. Okay, what's another word for mean that everybody knows? And don't tell me like angry bad person or something. What's another word for mean? It's a simple, easy word. Yeah, average. Yeah, average. So the average or the mean is about 277 miles. Notice that the mean does not tell you where the typical person lives. In fact, nobody lives anywhere close to 277 miles from here. You see that? And that happens a lot of times when you're taking statistics. So the mean tells you something, but it does not tell you the typical value. It tells you the average value. Does that make sense to all of you? Okay, the sample variance is uh, 46,779 miles. Actually, it's not miles, it's miles squared. That one is the variance. It's not that important, but sometimes you'll see it. So I'm not gonna go into what it's about. If you think you completely understand it, you're probably wrong. So if when I ask you to explain all the statistics, that's one you could say the variance was 46,779 and stop there, don't even try. Sample standard deviation, on the other hand, that is the second most important statistic in this class. So the mean was the most important, standard deviation is the second most important. Um, has any of you heard of standard deviation before? Again, if you haven't, that's fine. You heard of it, of what it tells you or what it's about. Okay, so maybe that's a no because I'm not seeing anyone jump in. So the standard deviation tells you how spread out the data is. So notice that 216, that's a lot of miles. But if you look at the data, it's pretty, it's all over the place. There's people that are 469 and 70 miles. There's people that are just two miles away. So there's a big spread in the number of miles that you guys live from Lake Tahoe Community College. Does that make sense? So what you can say is if you, if you double that number, it turns out, you get 436, uh, 432 about. So if we take the mean and you go up and down 432, that's going to collect just about everyone. Okay. Uh, typically like 95%, but that, in this small group, that's everyone. Okay. If we just look up and down to 16 from 277, that gets the majority, but not everyone typically. So you'll notice we missed the two and the five on that one. So we got a bunch of you, but not everyone. Okay, so it gives you an idea of how spread out the data is. Any questions on that? The median, that one you probably heard. You get that in fourth grade, which might mean you all forgot what it is. And you remember what the median is, a, a very easy word for median? Also middle? Huh? Middle? Yeah, it's the middle number. Um, if there happens to be an even number of numbers, which there aren't here, now there's an odd. If there's an even number, you take the average of the two middles, right? Because there's going to be a two middles instead of one middle. When you have an odd number, it's truly the middle number. Okay, so 374, that usually gives you a better idea of the typical distance than the mean. Um, median is used in certain places. Where have you seen the word median used? What situations? I'm sure you've heard it. Uh, median income, like median income? Yeah, median income. And the idea of that is if you hear the median income, that will much tell you what the community's like. Because 
there's always, at least in our community, I don't know how your community is, but most of the people are middle to lower class. And then there's that one billionaire, right? You've heard of that person, right? And if you take the mean, that one billionaire is gonna skew everything so high that nobody's anywhere near that. Does that make sense? And the median is gonna give you the typical person for income. You also hear it with um, home prices. You've probably heard median home price before. Again, um, like in our town, I live pretty close to the median home price. I have an average house. On the other hand, if you know anything about Tahoe, there's that super house by the lake that's worth you know, $75 million. So if you took the average, you're gonna end up, the average is gonna be a house like no other house in this town because you have this few super houses and then everyone else has an average house, uh, has a kind of a typical house. So the median will give you the typical much better than the mean does. Okay. The mean is good for lots of reasons too though. One thing is average, which most people are familiar with. Another is if you are interested, for example, in how much tax revenue you're gonna get, then the median, the mean is better because that super house has to pay a lot more taxes than everyone else. So you don't wanna disregard the really high-end ones. We call those high-end ones outliers. Also low-end or outliers. Any questions on that? Okay, maximum, you show oh. what that is. Okay, Q1 and Q3, I'm gonna put those together. Q1 and Q3 are the quartiles. So a lot of times you take your data and you wanna break it up into four, four quarters. So the median breaks it in half, and then Q1 breaks the bottom half into halves. Q3 breaks the top half into halves. So basically, Q1, Q3, and the median break the data into four pieces. Do you see how that works? Okay, I'm gonna show you something. If you go to stats, box plot, then this is a picture of the maximum, the minimum, the first and third quartiles, and the median. Any questions on that? So this is called a box plot. Okay, so it's a good thing to know and you should be able to do that. It's also in the book and it's in the lectures. You're gonna be able to handle it and you can use this um, program to create a box plot pretty easily. Okay, um, I'm not gonna go into confidence levels and H1 and all that. That's a bunch of other chapters that's too complex for today. I do wanna talk about the Z-score. The Z-score has a special formula. What you do is you take a value, and then what you do is you take that value, you subtract the mean, see what you get, and then divide by the standard deviation. So it's the value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So notice it says change this because the value is what you might be interested in. So for example, Sacramento is 100 miles away from Tahoe. Let's see what the Z-score is for Sacramento. So I'm gonna type in 100, and it's gonna take 100 minus 277 divided by 216, and we get negative 0.8. So what that does is it is a nice way of understanding a value without knowing all of the data. So for example, I like this one. Um, if I told you on my SAT exam, when I took it in, by the way, 1983 is when I took my SAT, I got 1170 points on it. What do you know about me in terms of, did I do well on the SAT? What do you think? Okay, the answer is you know nothing. You don't even know what, how high, how many points it was out of, right? Unless you're my age and you happen to remember the SAT in those days, but I doubt it. My guess is none of you know 
what the SAT was like in 1983. Do you agree? On the other hand, if I tell you my z-score was 2.7, now what can you say about my SAT score? That's supposed to tell you something. What does it tell you? Okay. Yeah, it meant I had a really good score. I got into a UC campus. Okay. What it also means is I wasn't the smartest person in California. That would be more of a z-score of 4.5. Because remember, I told you most of the data is within two standard deviations. You go up and down two standard deviations. Um, almost all of it's within three, but not all of it. So 2.7 is actually pretty good. It got me into a good university. Okay. I was, as you can might be able to guess, I was very lopsided. There's a math score and there's an English score. Any guess on what my scores were like? Okay. You should be able to guess this one. I did super well on math and I was okay in English. Okay. I, I, I could write a paragraph, but I'm definitely not going to be, you know, as good as some of you in terms of your English skills. But my math skills were really, really good. So my z-score in math was off the charts. And my z-score as English was probably around maybe 0 0.3, which is a little tiny bit above average, but not much above average. I was kind of average-ish. Any questions on the z-score idea? If the z-score is, question? Can you give me one more time that formula, how you get the z-score? You said it's the? It's the value, so like the 100. Okay. The x value minus the mean. So in this case, the mean was 277. Divided by this, um, the deviation? This yeah, and note that first you have to do the subtraction, then you do the division. So okay. there's parentheses around the subtraction to make order of operations work. Gotcha. And all these formulas are in the book and in the lecture and all that, but it's an important one, so I wanted to get you there. IQR, also important. That is Q1 minus Q3. What it tells you is how spread out the middle 50% is. Okay, in this case, it's, you guys are really spread out. Okay, we're looking at 382.5 is a huge number of miles when you think about it. So this was a very spread out group. Okay, um, the rest of this, don't worry about. Maybe mode, except in this case, there was no, no one said the same thing twice, so there was no mode. That's why it says NA. There is no mode. Any questions on any of the statistics? One thing you might notice, how much math did you have to do to calculate all this using this program? Not very much. Yeah, zero. You had to type in the numbers. I don't know if you call that math. Probably not. You have to know how to read a number. Um, that's about it. So this class is going to be, if you love math, I apologize, you might be a little frustrated. Um, but if, you, if math is not the favorite thing for you to do in the world, um, we use technology. But what you have to do is be able to understand what these numbers mean. And that's really about this course. Any questions on that? Any questions? Okay, I want to um, spend the last bit answering a few questions that are kind of more homework type of problems. So let me have to stop sharing and start sharing, I believe. And then start sharing, stop recording. Just a minute. Where is the share? Screen share, there it is. And let me go to this guy. Okay, so now we're off the web and it's a Word document. Okay, so I have a few questions we wanna look at. And this is a handout I give. Um, and I put in the pertinent questions. So compare and contrast information gained from viewing a histogram, a stem and leaf, and a box plot. Okay, so let me remind you, I'm hoping that you know some of this. Uh, I'm not sure, it depends on how old you are actually, because all the kids nowadays get all three of these in school. But if you graduated not very recently, then you may not have seen them. Histogram you probably saw. You guys know what a histogram is? What it looks like? 
You remember? It's a yeah. bunch of rectangles. Okay, and in fact, we saw a histogram. Maybe I need to, let me stop sharing because I see a lot of, not a lot of answers here. And let me um, start sharing and go back to that Google Sheets. So do you see the histogram in the middle here? So a histogram is a bar chart that talks about frequencies of intervals. So there were two people between zero and 100 miles. One person between 100 and 200, nobody between 200 and 300, one person between three and 400, and uh, three people between 400 and 500. Very simple, that's what a histogram does. The box plot I showed you. The stem and leaf is also interesting. So I'm gonna do stem and leaf by hundreds, so I need to turn this into a two so that we can do um, the, the left-hand side are gonna be hundreds. And now I'm gonna go to stat, stem and leaf, So there's a stem and leaf diagram. What it does is it looks at, there were two people that were less than 100, and we have one that rounded to, a, to zero, and the other rounded to, 100, to 10. We have one person that rounded to 160, one, uh, three people, uh, sorry, um, one person that rounded to 370, one person that rounded to 460, one, and two people that rounded to 470. But do you see what stem and leaves do? So the stems are the leftmost digit, and the leaves are the next digit. Any questions on that? Okay, so now I'm gonna stop, stop so we can answer this, and then let's go back to that question. Okay. So let's see either in the chat box or in, um, or just talk it out. But when do you wanna use a stem and leaf? When do you wanna use a histogram? When do you wanna use a box plot? Any thoughts? And when don't you? So what, what's good about each of them? What do they show? And what I'm not seeing is the chat box, so it's probably in there somewhere. Let's try this. So oh, that didn't work. So what do they show? The histogram shows growth, right? Or something like that? Shows growth? Uh, maybe a little bit. What do you mean by that, actually? I don't know. Um, it, I don't know, it, it, the way it looked like the, the bars go, I guess, no, that's different. Never mind. Okay, it shows something. What it shows is frequencies, frequencies of intervals. Does that make sense? What you can't yeah. do in the histogram is get exact values. We know that there were three people somewhere between 400 and 500. Do you see that? Do you remember that? We don't know. Yes how many miles they were. We only know they were between 400 and 500. So it's good in that even if you have a million people, you can still do a histogram. That's easy, you just readjust the y-axis. But you can't tell the exact data values. You'll never get the data values back. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, the other thing, uh, where are we? Let's go back. There we go, stop share and start share. So the other thing that, um, so if you look at the stem and leaf, that gives you the values, do you see that? At least rounded to the two, deaths, two significant digits. But if you had a million people, you can't do it because you have to list one item for each, each person and good luck listing a million numbers. It doesn't work for a presentation. Do you agree? Also with stem and leaf, it shows a lot of numbers. And presentations are important. And if you're dealing with an audience that doesn't like numbers, that like hates math, do you know anyone that hates math? Maybe some of you, hopefully not too much. But if they hate math, you put a stem and leaf up on a, a PowerPoint, there's gonna turn out. 
they're gonna they're gonna run out of that room okay because it's ugly it's lots of numbers and they hate numbers so it doesn't work for that the other problem with stem and leaf is that if you haven't had statistics you may not know what it is whereas histograms most people know what they are box plot has that same issue if you haven't had statistics you don't know what a box plot is okay i showed you a box plot that was remember the minimum the first quartile the median the third quartile and the maximum but again if you're not told that and you show a box plot it's meaningless so that's only work working on an educated audience the histogram is really good for understanding the shape of the distribution okay you can see there are a whole lot on the high level not so many on the small level maybe there were two big modes that you'll see with the histogram and you won't see with this, with the box plot does that make sense to all of you okay so the next question is compare and contrast information um, gained from mean versus a median when is a median helpful and when is the mean helpful okay we don't have a lot of time so i'll just remind you median was great for um, getting a typical home right price you get an idea of what the community is like the mean is much better if you want to find out what the total amount of tax revenue you have okay mean gives you the average median only gives you the, the middle number the mean is influenced by outliers by a lot so is the standard deviation by the way the median is not if you have 100 people and all of a sudden someone walks in and there are 10 times the rest of them in the data set that won't matter much with the median but it matters with the mean okay how about getting an 80 percent on an exam and being in the 80th percentile again percentile is something you've heard before in your prior math classes but I want to remind you, is, are those the same thing? If you're in the 80th percentile, what do you think your grade is in this class? Any thoughts? What, what grade do you think you're going to get? If your score is in the 80th percentile. Aha, uh -huh. some reason it's not letting me look at the chat box. Just a minute, I'll figure it out. Chats. Have it there. Ah, here we go, got it. Okay, not very good. Actually, the opposite. If you're in the 80th percentile, you're going to probably get an, almost certainly going to get an A in this class. Because that means that in the class, 80% are worse than you. You're better than most people. So you're probably going to get an A. Okay, if you get an 80% on the exam, then what's your grade? And if you watch the orientation, then you know. That's a hint. So what do you think that is? A B? Yeah, it's a B, a B minus actually, because it's the lowest B you can possibly get. Okay. So that's actually a much worse grade than being in the 80th percentile. See how that works? Okay, so percentiles will give you an idea of where you stand compared to everyone else. And percent is an exact score. Okay, so for example, if I told you that um, my little kitten was seven ounces when it was born, Unless you are an expert, like if you were a, veterinar vet a veterinarian or something, you probably don't have a good idea of whether that was a big little big kitten or a little kitten at birth. Do you see that? Because that's a raw score. It's a, it's a number that I told you. But if I told you my little kitten was in the second percentile, what do you know about that little kitten? So if the kitten was in the second percentile for weight, what do you know about that little kitten? Yeah, it was tiny. It was a really, really little kitten, maybe worried about its health. 
Okay, and then the last question. Suppose the average woman's weight is 166 pounds with a standard deviation of 27 pounds. Suppose that the average weight of a female poodle is 52 pounds and the standard deviation is 3.5 pounds. You see a 210 pound woman walking her 64 pound poodle. Can you picture it? Who is more unusually large, the woman or her poodle? So how do you decide what's more unusual? And the hint is there's a special statistic I talked about that had a formula which I gave and someone even asked about it. Do you remember in one letter what that statistic was? And you remember? Was it the Z-score? Yeah, it was a Z-score. So let me remind you one more time about the Z-score. And I am going to uh, pop in an equation. You could say Z is equal to, come on computer, it's not happy right now. It just froze on me, sorry about this. That happens sometimes, sorry about that. I'm using the college computer, which is usually pretty good, but let's try it again. Got it. So it's x minus, ah, shoot. Let it be in a little box. x minus mu. And mu looks like one of these guys over sigma. Sigma, I think, is the next one down. There it is. So it's another way of saying it's the value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So for the woman, it's 166 minus 27 divided by the standard deviation, which, oh, sorry, 166 minus uh, 210 divided by the standard deviation, which is 27. For the poodle, the poodle's weight was 50, uh, 64 minus the 52 pound average or mean divided by the standard deviation, which is 3.5. So what do you get? I'll let you put in your calculator. What do you get for women? I don't expect you to use by hand, but I expect you to be able to use a calculator. And by the way, you should always bring a calculator to these webinars because then you can follow along a lot better. Sometimes I'll show you directly on a calculator when it's fancy. But this is arithmetic. You should be able to do a calculator. Tell me what you get. Maybe I'll do it in my head. Okay, negative 1.63. Let me double check. Yep, that's what I get to in my head. Okay. Notice, Bryce, it's a negative value. And the negative is important because that means it's on the low side. And for the poodle? So that one is? Three. Huh? 3.43? 3.43? Yeah, I get about that. Doing it in my head. When I do it in my head, it's not perfect, of course, because it's hard. But I can basically get it. Okay. So, and um, let's see. Oh, did I do it backwards? Sorry about that. I did it backwards. It is positive. It was my fault. Because the X was 210 and the mean was 166. So, which is more unusually large? Which is more unusual, the poodle or the woman? What do you think, based on the z-score? Yeah, the poodle. 
Okay, the poodle is much more unusually large because the poodle z-score is 3.43. That's a that's an extreme outlier, whereas a woman is actually not that unusual. Not even two for a z-score. So you would say, ah, well, there's a woman, and she is walking a gigantic poodle. Do you see that? Okay, even though the woman weighs more, but the poodle's more unusual. Any questions on that? Okay, I'm going to call it, I want to give you the secret word of the day. And actually, let's make it big font, large type in red. And the secret word is stratified. Hopefully you remember what that means. Stratified sampling means that you go and find out the population's distribution and then you have some strata that you're interested in, some like race or gender or age. And then you multiply your sample size by the proportions and then you sample that many of each type. And that's stratified. And that is the secret word of the day. I always try and pick a secret word to be something that relates to what we've done. Um, the secret word quiz is not up yet because I just made the word stratified up right now. So I have to make the secret word up. It'll probably be up tonight. It'll give you plenty of time. It's not due till Sunday. So I am going to um, stop the recording. Let me find it. Uh,